Welcome to Be Happier in Spite of Your Life with your host, Ann Reed. Come join the conversation as Ann will focus on helping you feel happier and thrive instead of just survive. Ann shares some of her life experiences and how she has learned to overcome her own painful times. So please welcome the host of Be Happier in Spite of Your Life, Ann Reed. I am your host, Ann Reed, of Be Happier in Spite of Your Life on Bow Brave TV Network. So I want to welcome everyone, whether you are listening or watching. Anyway, today we're going to talk with someone with an autoimmune disease. But first, I want to let you know who I am. I'm a certified coach, and I specialize in helping people feel happier no matter what is going on in their life. I like to think of it, a new word, is helping people sur thrive instead of just survive. This show is one of the ways that I'm reaching out to everyone to share my research, my training, and my philosophy. And I will consider it a success if you have learned something, if you're inspired by my guest story, and if you feel more hopeful at the end. Working on happiness is the one thing that studies have shown can improve your physical and mental health, increase your wealth, and deepen and improve your relationships. Why wouldn't you study it? It has also been proven in a study of more than almost a million people, I was going to say more, that's not accurate, that happiness comes before success. I know a lot of times we think, oh, successful people are happy. But when you get down and really study it, those people that are successful were happy before. Also, as I like to joke, no one has ever hired me to coach them to be unhappier. So, just to start, definition of happiness, it's different for everyone. You get to choose what it means to you. It can range from that euphoric joy, to being content, to just an absence of negativity. It's your choice. No one else can tell you what it is supposed to be. Also, being humans, we cannot eliminate having negative emotions in their life. So I'm not the perky cheerleader who's saying, oh, let's be happy all the time. That is not reality. But what I try to teach and inspire is that you can improve how you feel, even when your times are fearful or angry, or helpless, or in grief. They're all part of being human and are just a necessary part of us, that contraindication or side of feeling joy. So let's talk about negative emotions for a minute. Have a question for you. How would you feel if you got a medical diagnosis about something that would be with you for the rest of your life and is possibly even life-threatening. Could be cancer, could be diabetes, congestive heart failure, etc. I quickly wrote my own list. I came up with abject and total fear, helplessness, hopelessness, worried, and angry. I think most of us in getting that kind of diagnosis would end up over the course of time going through the five stages of grief, as Elizabeth Kubler-Ross had outlined on her in her book on death and dying. But going from denial, like you can't believe it, to angry, for that one, that'd be like, why me? Uh, bargaining, like whoever your higher power is, I promise 
if you make me better, make it go away, whatever, I will be nicer to my wife, not kick the dog, whatever it is in your life. Depression is another side of it, that helplessness and, and just hopeless. And eventually, most of us work through and come to acceptance, which is really, I can go on. Now, in honesty, I acknowledge that my initial quick responses had nothing to do with acceptance. And getting acceptance really is a process, but it is the ultimate goal and where you can live being happier in spite of what's going on in your life. For today's show, we have a guest who is living with a neurological autoimmune disease who will generously share his experience from diagnosis to acceptance and figuring out how to live the, his best life on a daily basis. Now, a very quick layperson's primer on autoimmune diseases. It's when the body's natural defense system can't tell the difference between your own cells and foreign cells, causing the body to mistakenly attack your normal cells. There are more than 80 types of autoimmune diseases that have been identified that affect a wide range of body parts. There is a much higher occurrence in women, and there are a lot of common symptoms. It can be joint pain and swelling, fatigue, skin problems, abdominal or digestive pain, recurring fever, neurological issues, swollen glands. That's just some of them. There are also psychological effects of receiving this diagnosis. Depression, anxiety, and suicide are common mental health conditions that often follow. So today's guest, I remember exactly when I heard the words, I have multiple sclerosis or MS. I was standing in my kitchen on a summer day. I remember what the weather was. I remember what I was wearing. And the reason I remember all this, this person is none other than my brother. August 3rd, 2000, my niece was gen just three and my nephew one. My brother was in a very busy medical practice. My sister-in-law worked full time and wham, a life-changing diagnosis. So he is unique and that he really, my brother, and that he has a foot kind of on both sides of this. He is a doctor and a patient. So he'll be sharing some about both sides. He is also dealing with an illness that will be around for the rest of his life. Will is, a board, certi is board certified in family practice and geriatrics, has been in practice for 35 years, frequently functions as an attending physician and is also consistently in the Castle Connolly top docks for his area out around Philadelphia. So his name is Will Dickerman, and he lives and practices in the Philadelphia suburbs. So Will, thank you for coming on my show and sharing your journey and answering my questions. And thank you for having me. <laughs> so do you want to give us a little bit of background about yourself and then really how you migrated and into medicine and decided to be a doctor to begin with? So we were born in the Chando Valley of Virginia on a farm with 200 acres with a father who wanted to be both a farmer and a doctor, two professions yeah. that don't necessarily go hand in hand. <laughs> Uh, so he became more of a doctor and less of a farmer, but that was the early exposure and influence in my yep. life. 
And uh, he was well respected in the community. People loved him. He seemed to be helping people. It was always kind of a very positive experience with him being a, a family physician and a well respected member of the community. I went on through high school and as a uh, young college student, had a couple professors who were very near and dear to me. And they kind of encouraged me to go into medicine. I was doing well in biology. I was doing well in physiology. I love those courses. And uh, this discussion of pharmacy school research, I didn't like. Uh, it was medicine. It was veterinary medicine, maybe optometry. But ultimately, I was drawn to medicine. It was an opportunity to work with people, help people, and learn through my life. Finished college, looked at allopathic medical schools, University of Virginia Medical College, right. Virginia. Looked at PCOM in Philadelphia, the osteopathic school. Ultimately decided to come to PCOM in 1982. Graduated in 1986, did internship and residency in the suburbs, and have been in practice here ever since. Wow. Can't believe it's 35 years. <laughs> One day at a time. <laughs> yep. So while med school can be torturous and a lot of sleep deprivation and cramming facts in your brain and whatever, I would think that becoming a lifelong patient of a disease for which there are currently no cures is has its own challenges so can you explain i mean you can even put this outside of layman's terms really what ms is let's be specific about your g your disease so a lot of the concepts are universal for any kind of long-term illness so and then how did you how did it impact you emotionally yeah, so multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease where the body's immune system attacks the myelin sheath of the central nervous system, so the brain and the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. Most theories support that it's probably we have some viral infection. The Epstein-Barr virus has been looked at a lot. Turns on our immune system. Instead of turning back off, it looks for other things. It's looking for this invader to attack. And unfortunately, what it starts to attack in this case it's the central nervous system, the brain, no. and the spinal cord. The most common symptoms are fatigue is an early symptom, visual changes, numbness, tingling, weakness, balance problems, trouble with bowels, trouble with bladder. Um, and there's several types of MS, relapsing, remitting being the most common. And then there are other progressive forms of MS and certainly years ago, a significant number of people ended up with progressive disability, needing help at home, maybe ending up in nursing homes, needing long-term care, uh, all outcomes that most of us would not particularly like to have. Wow. So I know how I felt. How did you feel? And you also have sort of an amusing story about how you found out, too. <laughs> So on August 3rd, 2000, uh, actually the day before August 2nd, I was working. I was in the office and I felt like somebody was buzzing my left palm of my left hand. It was almost like this little vibrator in my left hand. I'd been really wow. tired for probably a month. Had a one-year-old and three-year-old at home. I was working in a practice. I joined my uh, director of my residency and then the other physician there had passed away. And it was busy. I mean, I often worked 12 out of 14 days. I was on call. I was getting woken up. I'm a type A personality. I'm intense. Really? <laughs> I'm always doing things. And uh, I was trying to work hard. I was trying to have time with my family. I was trying to do the activities I enjoy doing. I was trying to continue to learn. And that night in the office, I felt absolutely terrible. I was exhausted. My head hurt. I was nauseous. And I had this weird feeling in my hand. I went Let's to stop there and describe. I know it was pretty dramatic when you woke up the next morning. So I so went we, home. And I told my wife, down. I said, I don't feel well. I'm going to bed. <laughs> so. Which probably was not a good thing since I usually got the children at that point. Um, 
But I went to bed and I woke up the following morning and I went to stand up and I fell on the floor. All right, stop right there. We have a cliffhanger. We're gonna take a two minute break for our sponsors. This is Ann Reed on Be Happier in Spite of Your Life on Bull Brave TV Network. See you shortly. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. You are back on Bo Brave Media on Be Happier in Spite of Your Life with your host, Ann Reed. And we are continuing with my guest, Will Dickerman, as he is describing that 24 hours before endearing his diagnoses and what some of his symptoms were. So, Will, you had gone to bed hoping to sleep, but assuming the kids might wake you up. <laughs> and hoping to feel better in the morning. And hoping to feel not. better. <laughs> so... Uh... Yeah, I got up and landed on the floor, which was a bit of a surprise. And the whole left side of my body was numb. If if I went to touch like the bed, it didn't feel like the bed spread. If I touched the dog, it didn't feel like the dog. No. And visually I was okay, but I felt motion sick. Every time I moved around, I would get nauseous, like I'd come off an amusement park ride. So I struggled uh, to get the kids up because that's what I did early in the morning. When they right, because work. your wife went to work <laughs> by 6 a.m. every morning. So <laughs> zero dark, as she calls it. So we got, yeah, oh, dark hundred. Oh, so dark managed, hundred. Okay. We managed to get the kids dressed and get them up. And I made a phone call to one of my peers who's a neurologist and said, I have either Lyme disease or MS. And he oh. goes, well, would you like to tell me your symptoms before you diagnose yourself? <laughs> oh, you mean he makes you do that too, huh? <laughs> so we had somebody coming to watch the children because I would have gone to work later that day. And I went and got lab work done at my office and I went to his office and he did a neurologic exam on me. And again, the sensory of my left side of my body was not accurate. And I had this bear hug sensation that MS patients will talk about where it feels like somebody's squeezing you around your chest, which is a really bizarre feeling. But we were able to get an MRI done that day. And we went into the MRI machine and he stopped over as I was finishing up because he was on his way to the hospital. He looked at the scans and he comes out to Wendy and I and he goes, thank goodness you only have MS. I think Wendy hit him. <laughs> Did they ever speak after that? <laughs> and I was not overly thrilled with that particular <laughs> diagnosis. But he goes, the way your symptoms presented, I was worried that you had a brain tumor. Wow. So uh, he was being very enthusiastic that I had MS. Uh, I was less than enthusiastic about that diagnosis. 
So we had some blood work. We made sure I didn't have Lyme disease. I got a lumbar puncture done and we did a couple other tests. Uh, also, again, to make sure that I didn't have Lyme disease. And we arrived at the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. So the next four to six weeks, I lived with this terrible exhaustion, had a headache. My balance was not great. Every time I moved and I worked, I probably worked 50% of what I normally do, but I couldn't eat. I lost weight. I was weak. And emotionally, it was just this terrible feeling. And I wondered course, about that. The physical symptoms are one thing, but the diagnosis and feeling so bad really has feeling, you emotionally, I would think. Yeah. And you go, am I going to feel this way the rest of my life? I don't want to feel yeah. this way the rest of my life. Yeah. And so you start researching and it was interesting. I started reading things like this was pre Google. This was pre Google <laughs> or pre internet searches. So okay. I'm pulling up and I read this article in the New England Journal of Medicine that was done in France. We're talking about how 80% of people who start with MS will be disabled and will be needing assistance in their day to day living by the 20 wow. years after their diagnosis or something. That may not be 100% accurate, but. And at that moment, I said, you know what? I need to be a patient. I need to listen to the neurologist. I need to do what they tell me to do and quit trying to be the doctor. Wow. So we had this kind of four to six weeks of this very rocky road, not feeling well, and talking about potential treatments. They offered me steroids to stay help symptomatically, but we elected. That's kind of one of the first normal lines yeah. of defense, right? Yeah. So, I mean, if I'd had more issues with motor function, if I couldn't walk or I couldn't swallow, then we would have done steroids yeah. if my vision had gone. But we elected not to do steroids. And the neurologist referred me to a subspecialist in MS, who was Dr. Uh, Nobler, who I saw. And this was now pushing to late September, October. I was starting to feel a little better at this point. Mm -hmm. And so this was the medical side of the treatment when I got to Dr. Nobler. In the interim, my uh, wonderful and lovely wife, Wendy, is a dietitian. She embarked on a, a bit of research on her own as to what she do from a dietary standpoint. I think I would to... call it a mission. Yes. <laughs> what will we do for supplements and what are other things we can do? And so we sort of took this position. OK, this is the illness. This is the diagnosis. And what can we control in our life to make or, or create the greatest chance of living a normal life with this right. particular disease? And so on that side of the equation, we got essentially into a Mediterranean diet. We started omega-3 fatty acids. We started vitamin D. We started B-complex vitamins. And we went to a local acupuncturist and we started doing acupuncture. The, um, the appointment with Dr. Nobler was completed in early October, and we decided at that time there were a few treatments for multiple sclerosis from a pharmacologic standpoint. And, and I will take this brief moment to say that I think in the United States, I don't know how we are in the rest of the world, that I think our knee-jerk response to any condition is, what medicine can they give me? But I think that piece I just went into a minute ago was very important. What can you do in your life to make yourself healthier in addition to what medicine has to offer you? And I will add here that you do those things to this day. They are a part of who you are and how you live. They are. They've been incorporated totally into your life. So, and I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about interferon and what a joy it was going on that in a minute. <laughs> but... The other things we looked at in our life was how could I control my lifestyle better, which the end result right. was I ultimately left a practice that was owned by somebody else and went to work for myself. So I at least could control my work life better than I was being employed for someone. I became very protective of my sleep because one of the things yeah. that I grew up internship taught me, I don't really need to sleep but three out of four nights a week. <laughs> Probably not the healthiest thing in the world. And I decided that sleep is when your body heals itself. So I became very guarded in my sleep when I went to bed, when I would get up, and I became very regimented in my life. 
uh, for better or worse, that's how I've lived for the last many years in terms of what's my exercise routine, what's the appropriate amount of exercise to keep me healthy, what's the right diet, uh, when do I go to bed, and there are many things that I won't take on. Um, I've learned to say no when people ask me to do things, and I evaluate how much energy I have when people ask me to take on projects or head up committees or whatever it is. I always have to look at it and say, what is the value that I'm going to give to the society or to a medical community uh, versus what's the toll it will take on me to do it? Well, one of the hospitals even reached out to you about possibly becoming medical director. Yeah, the, um, and the not too far past. And you just decided that it was not a wise move for you with yeah, your have, health conditions. Yeah, yeah. five or six years ago, a bunch of the doctors wanted me to take over as chief of medical staff at the hospital up the street. And I have a busy practice. And fortunately, I have a good partner. And I now have two wonderful nurse practitioners that help me. But taking on the workload at the hospital in addition to the practice, I thought was going to be a detriment to my long term health. And I just didn't think the benefit to the hospital relative to the cost for me was there. Yeah. yeah. Well, you also, if I remember correctly, chose not to move for a larger house and take on different financial obligations. And then you've discussed some some issues, some insurance issues, too. Um, that you had to address some successfully and some not. Yeah, so, the, so there's a lot of interesting issues, certainly with the diagnosis of MS and many other autoimmune diseases. What is your future income potential? Is there a point where you may, may not be able to work or you can only work part time? Right. So I know we had bought our house when we got married in 1992 and we were looking to expand because we had children. We ultimately made the economic decision to keep our debt load low in the event that something happened. So we did a small addition on our house and stayed where we were. We drove less fancy cars and we drove them for longer. We paid off all our debt and really tried to financially position ourselves so that if something happened. Yeah, the what if. <laughs> yeah, if I suddenly woke up one day and was unable to work, were we in a position where we could stay financially afloat? Now, I tell many people, get disability insurance when you're a young, healthy person. Get it's it on cheap your, and easy. <laughs> get it on your own, don't, because if you get it through your employer and you leave the job, your insurance goes with, with the job. And if you get a diagnosis like MS or many other autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, go down the list, you're not going to get uh, disability insurance. And so well, I also, have long-term care insurance we've talked about. You can get yeah. life insurance, but not I can get life insurance, but I am unable to get long-term care insurance. So these are all right. kind of financial decisions you need to make along the way. Yeah, and we just tried to live a little more conservative financial lifestyle. We had a financial planner, and we never put all our money into retirement accounts because if something happened, yeah. we wouldn't be able to access it. Uh, health insurance, even of itself, because the health insurance came through Wendy, my wife, and we always had to be very careful and work to make sure that we could afford the medicine, because most yeah. MS treatments are sixty to eighty thousand dollars a year. Yep. So, and we were briefly going to talk about interferon, which is part of the kind of emotional part of the journey. So, one of the wonderful side effects of interferon is it can cause depression. So you have a diagnosis of MS, you don't feel great, you're not sure what your future life is going to be, and you now start a medication that makes you feel worse. It's not like you're taking a medicine that's going to make you feel better. So it's an immunomodulator. Some of the wonderful side effects included chills, night sweats, headaches, body aches, weakness, but also this reduction in mood. And and I could feel it and I knew what was going on. And as a medical practitioner, I had the advantage of saying, okay, just your body's going to get used to this. You just got to ride this wave for the next two, three, four weeks. And one of the things that really helped me was acupuncture, interestingly, and the exercise piece. But the acupuncture helped me sleep because the interferon definitely did not help me sleep. But it's nothing like 
feeling scared, feeling angry, feeling helpless and hopeless, and then being given a drug, which you choose to take, right. but that actually makes you feel worse. So we yes. will come back in a few minutes, uh, two to be exact, to be happier in spite of your life with Anne Reed on Bow Brave TV Network. See you shortly. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality? But it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating. Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well, be aware, be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, Hope, and Support for Caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. We are discussing the emotional, almost devastation of taking interferon with an MS diagnosis. And this is Ann Reed on Be Happier in Spite of Your Life. So Will, you were saying, I'll let you come back in that that was really when, uh, probably your worst time. You Not only did you have the disease and then emotionally you realize that your life is gonna be different, but then you had the pharmacological whammy of a medication that can also make you feel depressed and hopeless. Yeah, so that was kind of the low point in that beginning of the journey uh, when I started the interferon. And I really, it's the hopeless feeling. It's what's the rest of my life going to be. And it's the uncertainty of not knowing what's coming in the future. And I think at that point, we really started to just focus on, okay, these are the things we can control. These are things we have no control over. And we started to spend our energy on the things that we could control. And, and I think anytime you have a... Um, a chronic illness, you start to have gratitude for the good days. That's one There's of my a, main things about being happier. If you can find something little, even if it's your dog kissing you in the morning. Yeah. Your Tim day McGraw, is better. Yeah. <laughs> Tim McGraw has a great uh, song called Live Like You're Dying. Like you're Dying. I know. <laughs> I've, I've used that before. Yep. <laughs> and and so you start, you get up in the morning and you go, that's a beautiful sunrise. You know what? My dog came and licked me today. You know what? My daughter's having a good day today. She's well, not giving me a good deal. time this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. and, and I started to spend, I mean, I spent a lot of time with the kids and I did a lot of things. And, and it was interesting because early on, I wasn't sure physically what I was going to be able to do as I got older. So if I could take my kids skiing, I would. If I could carry them in the bike trailer, if I could take them fishing, I would take them fishing. If we could go out on a boat, we went out on a boat. I just did as many different things as I could with them um, and, and just try to enjoy each day and be grateful for the good part of each day and, and try to get to bed at night and, and, again, stay within the structure of the things we talked about earlier in terms of things to do to live healthy. Yeah. I know you've you said 
once to me, and this is probably 20 years ago, but it's in my profession, I can't afford to have a bad day. And I can't, uh, I really can't even put myself in the picture of feeling as bad as you must have at times. And for, it's not like a 24 or three day flu or something. I mean, it was over a period of time. And knowing that you had to go be making perfect decisions for other people. Yeah, I think it's uh, it, it's a toughness you have to get. We don't all have good days every day. And certainly <laughs> if, if you're battling illness, you're battling other issues in your life, uh, all sorts of physical and psychological stressors, you have to be able to get up in the morning. And our mother did this. Yep. She brushed her hair, she put on her makeup, she put on clothes, she made herself look good no matter how bad she felt. Yep. And and I would go into work and I would get my game face on and I would work my way through the day. And you really, as a physician, you can't have a bad day. You just, I know, I think that's what really hit you me. You can't make a mistake. And also you gotta be able to handle the complexity of people's emotions and reactions to whatever conditions you may be dealing with that day. And that part was exhausting. Yeah. Well, that could be exhausting without the overlay of yes. drugs and a, and a diagnosis. Did you ever resent the things that you had to give up or modify? No, I think my focus was more on trying to have a long, healthy life. And I've been blessed because I'm now yeah. almost 63 years old. I'm still working full time. I've been able to continue to do things with my kids and my friends. And the other thing, I never really hid my diagnosis from anybody, whether yeah. it was whether it was professionally or family or friends. That was going to be another question I had actually was how does having a lifetime uncurable diagnosis inform how you deal with your patients? Has it changed it? at all yeah i mean it, it's almost an advantage for me because i sit down and somebody in a room and they get a diagnosis we have a condition i go look i've been battling a lifelong chronic illness since i was 40 years old yeah. and and these are the things that i've done these are things that you can do to make yourself as healthy as you can possibly right. be and yeah, these are the things I can offer you, but these are the things that you need to be able to do in your life to make yourself feel better and hopefully do better. So I think it's actually an advantage. Well, that was another question too, was really with your doctor hat on for a minute, what, what can patients, excuse me, <clears throat> do to help their doctor or be a partner in the process. I know the first one that astounded me when we did our pre-show was you said they can keep their appointments. And yes. it just kind of hit me. <laughs> People wouldn't do that if they were in crisis. But anyway, apparently it does happen. <laughs> it does happen. So I think, uh, I mean, I think patients, maybe before they come to their appointments, they want to be organized. What are their symptoms? What testing have they had done already? What physicians may they have seen? what medicines, what supplements are they on? I mean, we're, I'm always curious what's their social network, where they live, what do they do for work, yeah. et cetera, because I wanna know what the safety net around them is. Uh, but beyond that, I think having a good primary care physician, which is getting harder and harder nowadays uh, because yeah. there's a progressive shortage in primary care and, and having a good specialist to hopefully interact and then having the patient going organized to the specialist, getting good information and hopefully a good flow of information back to the primary. And, and if you have a friend, you have a spouse, you have a family member who can go with you, it's yeah. not a bad thing because they hear things you don't hear and they remember things you don't remember. Particularly when you're in crisis or depressed or hurting and people yeah. are giving you information that may not be in your wheelhouse. You may not know the terms or understand what they're saying or even know what questions to ask. Yes. So I think sometimes having somebody along with you, not necessarily they need to be intimately involved, but they may remember things and they'll hear things when you leave the appointment. 
and try to make sure whatever, okay, this is our plan at the end of the appointment, triage what needs to be done, get things done and make sure everything gets followed through. It's amazing. People have something and they go out and then they feel better and then they don't show up. Okay, well that's when order. they don't show up. Okay. Yes. So what about the treatment plans and whatever? Do, do people really understand them? Are they cooperative and being part of the partnership usually or in making decisions? Or is that something that you really have to guide? Well, we're dealing with human beings and with human beings, you have the full spectrum yep. of people who are intimately involved and well organized to people who really don't care and are, are not organized at all. And I think that's a challenging part when people have chronic medical conditions. If they themselves are not well organized, then they need somebody with them and around them who is. Well, and another thing, and this is a setup, but what about the people who would be more like me in type A, who would have done a lot of research on Google before they arrived? Yeah, you're referring to- I know this is one of your favorites. <laughs> <laughs> you're referring to the sign in my office that says, don't uh, confuse your Google research with my medical degree. That yeah, somebody that one. <laughs> Somebody sent to me anonymously, so I'm not so quite <laughs> sure where that came from, but uh, my partner certainly loves it and now sits in the hallway. Um, <laughs> I think when Google first came out, I was like, oh, I guess we'll see patients less. But generally, we see patients more because when they Google things, they get the three worst conditions they could yes, possibly have. they think they're, they're dying, symptoms. right? <laughs> so they generally come to the office with the fear that they're either dying from cancer, or heart disease, or some other <laughs> autoimmune or neurodegenerative condition. Well, that must be fun to redirect. Yeah, it's always good if you can give them good news. Yeah, you're not dying from cancer. <laughs> it's your hangnail that you needed to have taken care of, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, you had an experience in 2009 that was pretty traumatic, which I will let you explain because I wasn't there with you but you got to practice pretty much all the things that I think you had learned with the MS diagnosis. And I just wondered if you thought that having those skills and kind of that processing in your life made it easier or harder to recover. Yeah, so in September, 2009, I worked late on Monday nights. I was driving home from work at, uh, probably 10, 10.30 at night. And I was on a highway where there were three lanes going up over a hill. Now, it should be 35 miles an hour, but somebody <laughs> high on drugs came over the top of the hill and hit me head on and rolled their SUV over my car. So I woke up in the car to the sounds of the jaws of life ripping my car apart so they could pull me out and ultimately fly me to the hospital in University of Pennsylvania to the trauma center, where I sustained about 11 broken bones. Uh, probably a traumatic brain injury or a concussion, certainly, and uh, a chest tube that was in for five days uh, and, and a whole lot of pain. So I was pretty much strapped into the bed from uh, Monday night till about Saturday when they let me go home. And, and it was amazing how the community and patients and people around me rallied and I got home and people were bringing me food and people were rocking my dogs and people were mowing my grass and the, the outshowing of support was uh, tremendous, uh, positive and recovery. That's one of the gratitude things, right? <laughs> but, yeah, again, you're in that position when you're lying in the hospital bed going, okay, how broken am I and what's my future life going to be? Well, you really didn't know if you would be 100% functional with the damage to your upper left side. I mean, with the broken bones and what have yeah, you. I had, three broken vertebrae, four broken ribs, broken scapula, broken radius, broken ulna. And my neck's still a little bit of a mess, but that's, <laughs> we live with that. But I think again, lying in the bed, it was like, okay, what can I do to recover and make myself as close to whole again as I possibly can? So I was on the phone with my friends as soon as I got out or physical therapist and 
we started okay. to outline a program of things I could do. I was out of work within two weeks. I got myself back working part time. I managed the pain with the least amount of medications I could. My acupuncture friend again helped me with pain management. And uh, I did all the things I could to facilitate my recovery. And I had a goal that I wanted to be able to ski that winter. And uh, we always we do good nutrition in our house because we have a dietitian for a <laughs> wife. And I took the advice of my physicians and I took the advice of my physical therapist and I slowly worked my way back. And they all said, yes, please go skiing in three months. <laughs> having a couple of plates in your had. arm. Okay. I just wanted to be clear on that, that you yeah, were I, I don't think that was their <laughs> primary interest in my recovery process. <laughs> so we, uh, yeah, and I would do stuff on the in-between days. I do five minutes here, 10 minutes there, but it was still that that same discipline. What are the things, what are the steps that I need to do to recover? And that wasn't really a medication pharmacologic journey. That was a rehabilitation reason, process. Yeah. And it was mentally how to deal with the pain and, and how to deal with kind of the anger of just useless, you know what? senseless, somebody else yeah. caused I'm driving it. home and somebody high on drugs just almost killed me and or could have made me a spinal cord injury or have ended my life. So yeah, yeah, but I had to get past that. I had to get rid of that negative energy and just focus on my recovery, focus on my family and focus back on my my business and my work and my patients. And, and you know, I think it helps. I mean, I'm fortunate that I'm in a profession that I enjoy helping people and I get to do a lot of positive things. And so when these events happen, it's all part of the motivation, too, to try to get back to, to continue to do that work. That makes sense. Well, we will stop here uh, and come back in two minutes and read on Be Happier in Spite of Your Life. And as you can tell, my brother said sometimes in situations that are not very happy. And yet he gets more joy out of each day than almost anybody I know. And it is by choice. See you shortly. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. You're back with Be Happier in Spite of Your Life with Ann Reed, her brother Will Dickerman, on Bo Brave TV Network. So, Will, do you want to share... I know you have some sayings and some quotes that you now live by. And also if you have one or two instances when you really felt that some of your experiences enabled you even better to help a patient or two. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, 
one of my sayings is the body follows what the mind is telling it. Yes. And certainly, okay. certainly in my experience and having an autoimmune disease and recovering from trauma, if I can get rid of the negative energy, get that positive energy in there, again, focus on the things that I can control and focus on the good in the day, I find the healing, the healing happens, the healing occurs. To our whatever body, level is possible. Our body has tremendous capacity to heal itself. It's a bit of an osteopathic concept. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just giving it the tools to do it. And so you have to figure out in your life and your condition, what are the tools that your body needs to heal itself? Yeah. Um, I think we had talked a little bit unrelated to this. We were just talking about patients and you and I were having a conversation on anxiety. We could I do said, a whole nother session on that. That's a whole nother session, but in the spectrum, in the spectrum of what's appropriate amount of worry or anxiety in one's life, I always say in the people I meet, I have the people on the one end who don't give a crap about anything. And I have the people on the other end who worry about everything. Everything. Yeah. And I think when you have a chronic illness, you need to conserve your energy and you have to figure out how to find that middle ground where, uh -huh. you know, these are the things that are important to me. And I, you may have given me this saying years ago, when I'm looking okay. at something and I go, is this going to be important to spend my energy on? Is it important in five minutes, five hours, five days, five weeks, five years? Puts and it in perspective. It's a way for me to create a triage to go, okay, I've got to take some time and spend some energy and deal with this particular issue. Or I can say, you know what, you know, in five months, this really doesn't matter. I can discard this and kind of move on to something else. Yeah. That's getting perspective and proportion, I think, are incredibly happy. Uh, excuse me, incredibly important to be in happier also. Everything can't be a crisis all the time. No. Uh, you just can't live that way uh, and be and healthy your, mentally not, or physically or emotionally. It's not good for your body. And I always thought when I got MS, it was a combination of I wasn't happy in my work situation. Right. I wasn't getting enough sleep. I was burning the candle on all ends. You had and, a three-year-old and a one-year-old. <laughs> yep. And I was trying to do all these things and my body one day just said enough's enough and, and it broke. And so uh -huh. what was the root cause analysis as to why it broke and can you fix that? Right. Do you have one, you may or may not, but have one or two times you think you particularly help patients with your wisdom on kind of these long term, lifelong incurable situations or how you would deal with it if someone came in? Yeah, I mean, we deal with a lot of folks. Um, I think I recently had a 23-year-old who had symptoms consistent with MS, and we're still a little bit finagling on the diagnosis. There's another condition called neuromyelitis optica, and we ruled that out. I won't repeat uh, it, but anyway, okay. Yeah, neuromyelitis <laughs> optica. Devix okay. disease is the other name for it. And... Mm -hmm. um, and I was talking to the neurologist, she may actually have an Epstein-Barr variant kind of cousin to MS, but here's a 23-year-old who comes in, and it's actually been an advantage to, to have MS when people come in. And her primary concerns in her life were, was she going to be able to have children? What did that mean? And I think a lot of autoimmune diseases affect women, as you said, and right. autoimmune diseases typically show up in middle life maybe adolescents, maybe 50s, 60s. But the great bulk of these things show up to people in their 20s and 30s and 40s. And these are people that have a life ahead of them. Right. And, and I think, again, part of my role is to, okay, let's make sure we have the correct diagnosis. What are your pharmacologic treatments or procedural treatments for that diagnosis? What are the rest of the things you can do in your life to make yourself healthier? And then try to answer some of these questions. I mean, I have no idea what's going to happen when she gets pregnant, but if she does all the other steps, she stacks her the chances, odds. chances, right. Or she, her she chances the odds are in her better. favor that when she gets pregnant, she has a child, she doesn't suddenly have an MS exacerbation on the backside. Right. Well, I can't tell you how much I appreciate 
you joining me for this. And you did have an option to say yes or no, though I don't know if I told you that up front. <laughs> I didn't see that spot in the box on the form. <laughs> you didn't see that in the contract, right? No. But I just feel, I mean, my whole thing is obviously on the emotional side of people being happier. But you have, you know, watching you deal with some of the things life has thrown you and bad things end up in everybody's life. If you end up living long enough, you're not going to avoid that. But that you really have dealt with all aspects of it from the physical to the pharmacologic to the emotional to really the things you can do day to day. So I just thought you would be a great guest. And I mean, I really hope your wisdom the things you've learned the easy way and the hard way um, and sharing have helped some people and given yeah, I, them hope. I tell so, my children, I said, you know, life is a journey with ups and downs. And I said, as you measure your life success by how you dealt with the hard times, not how yep. you did the good times. Yep. Well, another one, I have a very quick quote since we were talking about worry. Leo Biscaglia, the author and thought leader, worry never robs tomorrow of its sorrow. It only saps today of its joy. And basically, no matter how much you worry about something, you can't change the outcome. So it really serves no purpose. So this is Anne Reed on Be Happier in Spite of Your Life. I love to hear from people. So you can reach me on Instagram at Reed Coaching, R E I D Coaching. Um, Facebook is Ann Reed at Ann Reed Coaching 111. LinkedIn is Ann Reed. Pinterest is Ann Reed. And my website is Reed Coaching, R E I D C O A C H I N G. I would love to know what you think about my show. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. This has been Be Happier in Spite of Your Life with host Anne Reed. Tune in each week as Anne shows how each of us has the choice to make the best of things with the reward of sustaining better health, wealth, and relationships. Tuesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave TV Network.